Scripture reading for today is 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. For this very reason, make every effort to add your faith goodness, and goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and a mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, William, for that reading. Brennan, as always, for the songs and congregation for lending your hearts and voices so uh, enthusiastically and beautifully this morning as we have sung these praises to our God and Father, to our Savior, and to the Spirit who lives within us. Uh, first thing this morning, I'd like to ask, I, had, I didn't get to see her on the way in, but if Gloria Taft is with us this morning, would you? she is right back here. Gloria, do you mind standing just a second? There she is. Welcome, Gloria. Uh, Gloria has uh, made it known that she wants this to be her church home. She's lived in this area for quite a while. Uh, been a member of several churches around Tulsa, but uh, is a lovely, lovely Christian sister. And if you haven't met her yet, please do so before you leave today. And I've got a gift book that I will give to the first person who comes up to me. You'll have to chase me down because I don't know what I'm going to be doing right after the service. But first person that tracks me down that doesn't already know this that can find out where she grew up, where she was born, and where she grew up. It's an incredibly interesting place a long way from here. If I've got your curiosity up, go meet Gloria. And, you know, I've got a gift book for the first person that comes to me and says, hey, I met Gloria, and this is where she grew up. There's a lot going on. It's that time of year, November the 1st, and from here through the beginning of the year, there's a lot going on. So please reference your bulletin frequently and log all those things in. There are fellowship opportunities, service opportunities, special services. So just check the online bulletin, check your print bulletin. There is a blood drive going on today. In fact, it's going on right now over in the OC that will continue to 1230. You can get an excused absence from the sermon if you want to go donate blood at any time. It, you know, the thing is, you can always listen to the sermon online later. You can't give blood online later. So if you got to choose, go ahead and do that now. Check the sermon out later. And that gift of life and donation of blood will be very, very much appreciated. Poinsettia sales, memorial poinsettia sales uh, go on. Uh, they begin next Sunday, the 8th. The following Sunday, the 15th, is when the holiday harvest grocery donations are due. That's also the weekend, that Friday and Saturday, the 13th and 14th. That's the Ladies' Spiritual Retreat. Uh, I think, yes, there's still time to register for that today? No. Okay. If you are registered, please remember to go on the 13th and 14th. And you'll be reminded about this later also. Thanksgiving week, as we did last year, we're going to have our devotional service on Tuesday evening rather than Wednesday. We've got a lot of people hitting the road on, on Wednesday and are already away from us, so that Thanksgiving week devotional will be on Tuesday evening. And then, as I indicated in my article on the front of the bulletin, two very important weekends coming up, the 13th through the 15th and the 20th through the 22nd. We will have candidates here who will be spending the weekend with us. This is a part of our search for a new uh, youth and family minister. And you will be given a more detailed schedule of things that will be going, going on if it pertains to you, the age of your children. Make every effort to be at these events and to be very much a supporting part of this process. Since the first of those weekends, the 13th through the 15th, lands on a life group Sunday, you'll be hearing more about this as we get closer, but we will be suspending life groups in November just so that those weekends are as similar as possible and we can get everything that we need to get in on those weekends. So reprieve from, from life groups this month. 
So about the sermon title, um, Butterflies, Rainbows, and, and Unicorns. I started developing this, this message on Monday, and I had this tentative title that I submitted for the Wednesday Night News. You may have seen it printed there. Afterwards, I had two different people, totally independent of one another, express to me their, their feelings about how desperately dismal and depressing and negative sounding the, the title was. One of these people was somebody I work with on the staff. The other person was someone that I live with. And <laughs> normally I'm a little slow to come around on things like that. I want to stick to my guns and think, no, I've, I've I thought about this, and this, this is the title. And finally came to humble acceptance that it did sound like a bit of a downer and that I could have done a much better job with the title. So I thought about just calling it um, you're awesome, I'm awesome, we're all awesome. Uh, that, that's kind of encouraging. Or sort of this message from God, uh, seriously, uh, don't worry about it, it's all good. You know, that, that would certainly make everybody feel okay. But I thought the happiest place I could go was uh, butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns. Uh, some of the content, while you may be able to view it from a, a negative perspective, I certainly want to couch it in a positive setting because of the positive things that are going on. And so for a title that just uh, oozed with positivity and happiness and whimsy and cotton candy and joy, uh, that, that's what I came up with. And there's absolutely nothing in the lesson that has anything to do with either butterflies or rainbows or unicorns. I just wanted to keep you with me at least past the title and that, that's why I went there. With the photo, you may think that's a horse, but the photo's been cropped. It's really a unicorn. And it, the pictures in this one, it reminds me, uh, Morgan, who sits over here, she, she hands out stickers on Sunday mornings, and some of them have butterflies on them and rainbows. It, it kind of, some of you may have been gifted with some of Morgan's uh, stickers this morning. And she so, so generously shares them o over in that section. But now that I've got you smiling a little bit, I want to read you a really sad story that comes from a book with an even sadder title. The title of the book is Autopsy of a Deceased Church. So you can thank me for having a more upbeat title for the sermon. Uh, this is written by Tom Rayner. Shortly after I came here, I shared some lessons with you from Rayner's book, The Unchurched Next Door. He had a related book, Surprising Insights from the Unchurched Next Door. You know, we talked about how receptive many people are to respond positively to an invitation to something, to anything that we might want to invite them to. We think that they're not. We think they're closed. We think they're disinterested. We don't think they've got a spiritual bone in their body. And so often we are completely dead wrong about that. And so many people are at least somewhat likely to respond positively. So we, we worked off of some of Rayner's research in that regard. He's also authored the book Simple Church, which is very good. And he's a prolific writer, so there's a lot of titles. But this is how he begins this book. I knew the patient before she died. It was 10 years ago. She was very sick at the time, but she didn't want to admit it. There was only a glimmer of hope at best, but that hope could become a reality only with radical change. She wasn't nearly ready for that change. Indeed, she was highly resistant to any change, even though she was very sick, even though she was dying. I told her the bad news bluntly, you're dying. I hope I said those words with some compassion. I did feel badly sharing the news, but it was the only way I could see to get her attention. I even told her that at best she had five years to live. At the time I said those words, I don't really think I was that optimistic. I would not have been surprised if she died within a year. But she was not only in denial, she was in angry denial. I'll show you, she said, I'll prove you wrong, I'm not dying. Her words were fierce, defiant, angry. It was time for me to leave, I had done all I could do, I left. I was not angry, I was sad, very sad. Now to her credit, she was right up to a point, she did not die in five years. She proved resilient, survived another 10 years. But her last decade, though she was technically alive, was filled with pain, sickness, and despair. I'm not so sure her long-term survival was a good thing. She never got any better. 
She slowly and painfully deteriorated, and then she died. She, of course, is a church, a real church, a church in the Midwest, a church that was probably born out of vision, a church that died because she no longer had vision. And he shares that story because this was a church that he had consulted with over 10 years earlier. At the, you know, in their past, 1975, that, that church had been at, at its numeric height uh, in, in their history, about 750 average on Sunday mornings. By the time Rainer got there, their Sunday morning average attendance was 83. And most of the people in the church didn't want him there, uh, had no interest in him being there. There was a leader in the church, a benevolent leader in the church, who invited Rainer to come, offered to pay, uh, to, to foot the entire bill of the three weeks that he was going to, to spend with them. And you can imagine that, that he had a difficult task ahead of him. In 1975, no one in that church, 30 to 35 years uh, later, could have conceived that that church would not exist. So when he finished up the, the three weeks, you know, sort of like you would ask a doctor, um, you know, what, what, what do you think? Give us the news. And some who were already pessimistic about the church's survival asked him how long he thought their church could survive, and Rainer thought he could give them five years unless significant changes took place. If nothing changes, if you don't respond to these calls for greater spiritual health, then I give you five years. And as I've already read, he was, he was wrong. And consultants aren't God. They aren't prophetic prophets. This isn't science. So sometimes they're wrong, and he was wrong, but only about five years wrong. It took 10 years before that church closed its doors for the last time. He writes, like many dying churches, it held on to life tenaciously. The last 10 years uh, after my, uh, the church lasted 10 years after my declaration of, of terminal diagnosis. Autopsies are un unpleasant things. They're difficult things. Uh, Rainer tells the story also of something that happened in his family before his birth. He had uh, an older sister, older sibling that was born, died very young, died before he was born. But the family was just devastated, perplexed, and asked that an autopsy be done. And his, he was told later by his father that his father insisted on being in the room when the autopsy was performed because he just had to know why her little heart stopped, had to know why his little girl died. And so with experiences like this, with this one particular church, uh, Rayner thought, you know, maybe studying similar churches, we could do some autopsies. Those are performed for the benefit of the living. Uh, it's too late for the dead to be benefited by any autopsy unless it's some question of justice in regard to a crime. But generally it's done for the, the sake of the living and for something to be gained by the living. What can be learned, what can be avoided in the future, what can be prevented. So Rainer studied 14 churches that had once been vibrant, active, alive, influential, and then slowly declined to their deaths. Now 14, for those of you who are into statistics and research, that, that's not a very large sampling. It's not a very scientific sampling. In fact, he brings a lot of subjectivity to the process. Uh, but this was a significant diversity of churches, uh, denominational churches, non-denominational churches. They varied uh, in regard to the region of the country where they were. Some of those churches had been very affluent. Others were made up of the proletariat, just working class blue collar churches. And I probably don't have to ask you to think very long. In fact, looking at some of these pictures may have already caused you to think of churches that you have known. All over the map in size, all over the map in demographics, all over the map as to whether they were urban congregations or suburban congregations or rural congregations. And there was a time in all of those churches when no one could have conceived that that church would never be there. And yet today, that church isn't there. Um, 
no one would have ever imagined that it could have happened to them. So through Rainer's autopsies of, of these churches that were done with the cooperation of their former leadership and, and members, he found common characteristics among these churches that led to their demise. First point I want you to hear loud and clear is that the leadership of this church is committed to ensuring that the Broken Arrow Church of Christ is never included as a case study in a book like this. That's our intention, that's our desire, that's our hope, that's our prayer. Um, we don't want that to happen. That's why the elders and ministers are working together to recast a vision for the church, uh, for this church, for the future, to redefine and refine our mission. Uh, we've had an incredible, wonderful past that's existed for almost 100 years, and for that we are very grateful, we're deeply indebted, but the future is not going to look like that past. Uh, the future can't look like that past because we live in a different time. That's why we've been consulting with Kent Allen uh, to provide an outsider's objective third-party view, which can be extremely valuable in helping us assess our health, which is what all this is about. Uh, churches just don't die suddenly, out of the blue, uh, with no apparent causes. Uh, there are always issues, there are always spiritual health problems that lead to such an end. And that's what we're hoping uh, we can help identify to evaluate our strengths and our weaknesses, our opportunities, threats that could bring harm to the growth and, and spiritual life of this church. And you'll hear a lot more about those concepts during the Bible class hour next Sunday morning at 1030. All of our adult Bible classes are going to be in here to hear an update. When Jeff read on behalf of the, the elders, uh, that statement several weeks ago, one of the promises that was made was regular updates on the process. And this is the next of those regular updates. And so we'll have time to update you on where the process has been over the last few months, where we are now in the process and where we see the process going. So it's a very, very important meeting that we're gonna have together next Sunday morning, all adult classes in here at 10.30. One thing that I like about Rainer's book, even it is dismally depressing, uh, you know, the, the title, but he wants to couch this positively for the sake of the living, uh, for us, so that we never, ever, ever head down that road. And so he said it, it starts with, with prayer, and he offers these prayer commitments. We'll begin these this morning. We'll uh, conclude them next Sunday morning prior to, to that meeting. But prayer commitment number one, and these are all verbatim out of Rainer's book. This, this isn't me writing this, this is Rainer. God, open my eyes that I, might, that I may see my church as you see it. Let me see where change needs to take place, even if it is painful to me. And use me, I pray, to be an instrument of that change, whatever the cost. What these autopsies had in common was, first of all, discovery of slow erosion that had taken place. He tells the story of going back to his hometown because of something that he writes later. I suspect that may have been Anniston, Alabama, a place with which I'm familiar. His mom had died in 1997. It was over 10 years later before he went back to his hometown. And he was struck, he was shocked by what he saw. Back in the 60s and 70s when he was growing up, it was a thriving little town, quaint little town. You know, it's not a booming metropolis, Anniston, Alabama, but it was alive. Things were going on. He said it had a very Mayberry-like quality to it, very much alive and thriving. He said on his visit 10 years after his mom's death, it looked like a ghost town. Uh, Main Street businesses were closed and vacant as he peered in windows that, you know, the, the name of the business was barely visible anymore and it had just faded so much paint had chipped and as he kind of pressed his face with his hands around his head up up to the window and looked in he just saw these you know thick accumulations of dust on all the shelves and the floors in these empty shops he ran into an old acquaintance of his older than he a man that was at the time um, in his mid-60s and Rainer describes himself as a very 
upfront, get to the point person. He writes that way. I, I would assume him to be that way in personal relationships. So when he comes across the, this old friend, he just says, you know, what happened? What happened to, to our town? What happened to that place I remember as being so alive? And his old friend said, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean? Dead, deserted. Uh, what do you mean ghost town? And he didn't see it at all. It's because he had been there every day since Rainer had left. He had been there every week, every month, every year. You don't notice deterioration like that from day to day. Uh, growth sometimes comes quickly, but decline is typically very, very slow, and so we've got to have open eyes and receptive hearts to see that. Uh, the leadership here has seen it. That is, has seen a pattern, has seen a trend of slow numeric decline over the last 20 to 25 years. Look at the numbers, it's never fallen off the cliff, it's never been radical, it's never been dramatic, but the trend is downward, it's undeniably there. And we want to do something about that. We want to be a part of the reversal of that trend. We want to be a part of the solution to that trend. So what Rainer offers in regard to slow erosion is prayer commitment number two. God, please let me be a part of the solution and not the problem. Show me what I need to see. Open my eyes to your reality. And give me the courage to move forward in the direction you desire. Second symptom that, that he comes across in the autopsies is a symptom that he describes as the past is the hero. And again, um, indulge me as I read from him. The most pervasive and common thread of our autop autopsies was that the deceased churches lived for a long time with the past as hero. They held on more tightly with each uh, progressive year. They often clung to things of the past with desperation and fear, and when any internal or external force tried to change the past, they responded with anger and resolution. We will die before we change. And they did. Hear me clearly. These churches were not hanging on to biblical truths. That's not what the issues were. They were not clinging to clear Christian morality. They were not fighting for primary doctrines or secondary doctrines or even tertiary doctrines. As a matter of fact, they weren't fighting for doctrines at all. They were fighting for the past. They were fighting for the good old days, the way it used to be, the way we still want it to be. For sure, there were some prophets and dissenters in these churches. They warned others that if the church didn't change, it would die. But the stalwarts did not listen. They fiercely resisted. The dissenters left. And death came closer and closer. He goes to Hebrews 11 and talks about those great heroes of faith. He points to people like Abraham, and in regard to Abraham, it says, you know, he had many opportunities to go back the way he came. He could have gone back to Haran. He could have gone back to Ur. He wasn't interested in the past. He wasn't interested in what was behind him. He wasn't interested in going back. He was interested to what lay ahead. And in regard to these heroes of faith, uh, the good old days didn't exist in their minds. The future held the best days. And uh, they understood, Rainer says, that this life is not a time to get comfor comfortable. So a state of nostalgia is not a healthy state for a church to be in. And I believe we'll hear more about that next Sunday morning as to how in the life cycle of a dream, how in the life cycle of a church, uh, you can get into a state of nostalgia. And it should be a warning sign. So reading from Rainer again, I got an email today from someone who was really mad. I guess he was mad at me, but I'm not sure why. He described American churches as they were in the 70s and the 80s, perhaps earlier. He was mad about music styles. He was mad about church architecture. He was mad about audio speakers and big screens. He was mad about appropriate church attire. Yep, he was really mad. He should have written someone other than me, ask my sons. I'm neither cool nor contemporary. For him, the past was his hero. He was clinging, hanging on to things of this world, and because it was slipping away, he was angry, hurt, and probably fearful. Don't get me wrong, there is much to revere and remember about the past. I'm grateful for those who came before me. I'm grateful for events and people of the past that shaped my life. I remember my parents whose influence will never wane despite their deaths. I remember a high school football coach who shared the gospel with me. I remember a friend who went to Vietnam but didn't return. He died for our nation, including me. 
I remember the church where I was baptized in Anniston, Alabama. It seems that everything that took place in that church is a part of my good old days. Yes, we respect the past. At times we revere the past, but we can't live in the past. So prayer commitment number three, God give me the conviction and the courage to be like the heroes of Hebrews 11. Teach me not to hold on to the things in my church that are my personal preferences and styles. Show me not only how to let go, but where to let go, so that I may heed your commands more closely. Next item in the autopsy report, the church refused to look like the community. Uh, I love what the Fortress program is doing, what the Journeyman program is doing. Those are all positive aspects of, fort of Fortress. There are negative aspects of the concepts of Fortress. And these churches had become fortresses to keep themselves in and to keep others out. Um, another notation here to, to read from Rayner. I didn't know how much I was going to be quoting from him this morning, but cumulatively it seems like a lot. Uh, Paul told the church at Philippi to look after the interests of others, even as it considered its own interests. And then that familiar passage from Philippians 2, 1 through 4, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any aff affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should, not look, should look out not only for their own interests, but also for the interests of others. Not only their own preferences, but the preferences of others. And then he writes, did you get that? Vibrant and living churches look after the interests of others. They're concerned for their communities. They open the door for others. But dying churches are concerned with self-preservation. They're concerned with a certain way of doing church. They are all about self. Their doors are closed to the community. And I'm so grateful that that's not us. Uh, I can't speak to times in the past. I can just speak to the six and a half years that I've been here. That, that's not us. I'm glad that we're here. In these discussions that we've had with Kent, somewhere it came out that some years ago, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago or longer, uh, there was talk about moving, you know, identifying property out on the edge of development, uh, leaving this place and going there. And some of you probably remember that discussion. Uh, you may have been in favor of the decision to go. You may have been in, the fa in favor of the decision to stay. Uh, I wasn't here then, I don't know. But I do know that if this body of Christians were somewhere else, there would be a big hole in our immediate community. Somebody would fill that hole. I don't know who it would be. Somebody would. I'm just glad there's not a hole here. And I'm, I'm glad that we're doing what needs to be done in this community. I'm glad that we've got New Heights Summer Camp and Kids Care and the Roads Ministry and the Christmas party that's coming up and the Christmas assistance that we do and the clothing room and the food pantry and holiday harvest and all these other things that are going on. Um, I've asked you that question before that was posed to me by a Facebook friend that said if your church suddenly disappeared, I mean just tomorrow was gone, how long would it take your community to notice? It's a sobering question. Um, I'm grateful for the fact that some people in our community would notice tomorrow morning if we were gone. They would notice Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and they would notice on Thursday. So prayer commitment number four, God give my church and me a heart for our community. Let me see people through your eyes. Moving quickly over the next two and then we'll catch the, next, the rest of this next Sunday morning. Um, budget moved inwardly. Rainer writes, when you conduct an autopsy of a church, you must follow the money. For where the money of the church goes, so goes its heart. Jesus said something akin to that, uh, that where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be. We'll follow the money in a, in a church. He talks about Wellington Burt, died in 1919, the eighth richest man in America. He was a lumber baron. He was the mayor of Saginaw, Michigan. He was a member of the state senate in Michigan. And he was extremely greedy. He was irrationally greedy. So much so, he disliked his family so much, his children and his grandchildren, that he wrote in his will that nothing was to be dispersed from an from his estate, not a dime, until 21 years after the death of his last grandchild. Just for good measure. You know, wait till the last grandkid dies, then wait 21 years. 
if anybody's still around that's related to me, you know, give them my money. Uh, it took 92 years for that to happen. 2011 was, his, was when his estate was distributed um, to 12 distant family members that he never knew and that had never known him. God gives us blessings and resources to use, to use for the benefits of others. These dying churches had lost sight of that. What was spent was pretty much spent only on themselves. All the churches we autopsied, he writes, uh, in all of them, a financial pattern developed over time. The pattern was one where funds were used more to keep the machinery of the church moving, to keep the members happy, rather than funding the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. The money, though, was symptomatic of a heart problem. The church cared more for its own needs than the community and the world. No church can sustain such an inward focus indefinitely. It will eventually die of heart failure. And so the, the prayer commitment out of this, uh, Lord, help me grasp that all the money I think I have is really yours. Help me to grasp that all the money I think our church has is not the church's at all, but it's yours. Give us healthy giving hearts to use these funds according to your purpose. And then the final one we'll talk about this morning. Um, in all of those churches, the Great Commission had become the great omission. It just wasn't done. They weren't going, they weren't making disciples, they weren't baptizing people, and they weren't continuing to teach people. He says the deceased churches somewhere in its history forgot to act on the Great Commission, so they stopped going. They stopped making disciples and stopped baptizing them and stopped teaching them. So Rainer's prayer commitment out of, out of this autopsy, uh, part of the autopsy report, Lord, remind me that I am to be a Great Commission Christian in a Great Commission church. Remind me that in your strength I am to do whatever it takes to reach into my community with the transforming power of the gospel. So what's left on the autopsy report? Uh, the preference-driven church, where personal preferences become the driving force. Uh, ministerial tenure decreases. Uh, further into this illness, uh, the shorter and shorter ministers stayed. You can understand why. The church rarely prayed together. Uh, I'm grateful that that's not us. Uh, we do pray together. We're going to pray together next Sunday morning during our time together at, at 1030. And we're going to pray specifically about this process. And then the, the kicker, the clincher, the last one uh, in his autopsy report, that the church had no clear purpose. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we're seeking to recast that vision and recommit ourselves to a mission and a purpose with clear-cut goals and developed effective strategies that will help us get to that place. And so, despite the horribly depressing title of this book, uh, I'm extremely encouraged. I'm extremely excited about this process. Not only that, but others that are in the works. I'm excited about our youth and family search. I'm excited about these two guys that are coming in in, in mid-November. Uh, the committee thinks you're going to really like them. Uh, the committee thinks you're going to really love them. Whether they're fit for Broken Arrow, we don't know yet. Uh, they're coming here to assess us as well, so be on your best behavior. Those, you know, try to make a good impression on these guys, if, if you would. This, this thing goes both ways, so play nice uh, while, while they're here. Be, be welcoming, be, be friendly. Scott and I had a tremendously productive planning retreat last Tuesday, about the most productive five hours I've spent in a long, long time developing an overarching theme and quarterly themes to guide us through next year, bringing in outside speakers and having special seminars. And then there's another thing that you'll be hearing more about just in the next week or two. I can't even tell you what that is yet, but you'll know in a couple of weeks. So this passage, what's, you know, butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns got to do with the text that William read? Well, Will William read about those things that contribute to our personal spiritual health, but we also have a collective spiritual health that we need to be concerned about. And so after mentioning all these tremendous qualities that are not only a, a siren call to each of us individually to see if these qualities are ours and increasing, it's good to assess whether that's true of us collectively as well. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever doesn't have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, 
Make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you'll never stumble, and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's who we want to be as individual disciples and as a community of believers here at the Broken Arrow Church. And if you're not a part of that community of believers because you're still outside of Christ, then we would urge you, accept His promises, accept His grace, accept His forgiveness uh, through the power of His blood. Confess Him, be united with Him in, in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, if you need to recommit to Him, if you need to recommit to this church family, if there are burdens that, that you have that you want to share this morning with your brothers and sisters, we ask that you make those known to our shepherds while we're standing together and singing uh, as Brendan leads us. <laughs>